This film is an investigation into the largely illegal wildlife trade along the China-Myanmar border, formerly known as Burma. Carl Amman is a photographer, author and conservation activist. His trip starts in Tachilek, Thailand, near the Myanmar border, an important town within the Golden Triangle. Historically, the Golden Triangle has been the center of the opium trade, where warlords and drug barons dominated. With a tourist visa to enter the country, Aman and his translator and guide, Sai Win, discuss their route to their destination of Monglao in northern Myanmar on the Chinese border. Aman first visited the area when it opened to foreign travelers 17 years ago. At that time, many areas of northern Burma were controlled by ethnic rebel groups in conflict with the army of the central government. The road to the Shan state capital of Keng Tung was still under construction, largely by prison laborers. Today, travel is somewhat easier on a good tarmac road which winds through the hills of the Shan state. The first stop is Keng Tung, once the seat of the traditional Shan rulers. The government hotel in Keng Tung is where most tourists stay. During Aman's first visit, this was a car park where previously the Shan royal palace had stood. To counteract insurgency in the border regions, destroying ethnic cultures was, for some time, official government policy. Areas around Keng Tung were controlled by heavily armed rebels and drug dealers and classified as brown or black no-go zones. Within the last 15 years, the central government has signed peace deals with rebel commanders, including General Se Lin, who is now largely autonomous in the area north of Keng Tung, known today as Special Region 4. Today, however, roadblocks are still numerous, manned by immigration officials, police and soldiers. In some areas, there are still reports of rebel groups and soldiers terrorizing the civilian population. Aman has been visiting Myanmar for more than two decades. He considers it one of the most photogenic countries in Southeast Asia. Travel between Keng Tung and Mong Lao provides many pleasurable photographic opportunities. Here, a farmer uses a traditional method to clean rice left over from a recent harvest. For the last 30 years, Aman has lived in Kenya and is an established wildlife photographer. For the last decade, he has been documenting the bushmeat crisis in Central Africa. Wildlife, which in the West is admired in zoos, in many parts of Africa is considered just another meal. Aman did not expect to find a similar situation in such a traditional Buddhist country as Myanmar. Mong Lao is reached after a half day's drive from Keng Tung. Special Region 4, which borders China to the north, has its own army, its own customs and immigration control, car registration, and its currency is the Chinese one. The special regions came about as a, as a result of this fighting between the Burmese army and the, the various uh, indigenous groups along the border. So they gave them autonomy and they allowed them to essentially do their own thing. Uh, but they did want to clamp down on the drug trade, maybe not the Burmese so much, but the international community. So the result was they had to find other means of income. Soon after entering Special Region 4, the capital of Mong Lao is reached. We're looking down here on Mong La, that's the capital of the, uh, the Special Region 4, and used to be a big gambling capital, as one can see, casinos all over the place. So it seems things seem to have gone wrong between the Chinese and the leaders here, which are Wa, ex-warlords. Uh, and uh, now the Chinese are no longer allowed to cross over to spend big money here, so the town is a ghost town. Casinos are empty or shut down. 
On a hill on the outskirts of town stands the Opium Museum, an example of propaganda at its best. Today the region is free of large opium plantations. However, there are indications that domestic opium use continues and that the trade in narcotics now involves amphetamines. Here one finds pictures of General Tsai Lin, the ruler of Special Region 4. The general's father was a Malaysian Chinese and fought with the Malaysian Communist Party. Prior to becoming a commander in the Burmese People's Army in 1988, General Tsai Lin already controlled much of the Chinese border regions. His new residence, complete with golf course, is located on the outskirts of Mong Lao, paid for presumably with income from drug trafficking, as is much of the infrastructure within Special Region 4. Since the mid-1990s, diversification has taken place. For a time, Mong Lao was a center for gambling and prostitution, and the nouveau riche from the neighboring Chinese province of Hunan poured in. The Chinese gambling clientele brought with them an appetite for speciality wildlife foods. A dozen such speciality restaurants are located on one of Mong Lao's busiest streets, with many of the menu items displayed, still alive, on the sidewalks outside. Clearly, wildlife protection is not an issue here. The patrons are not eager to discuss their culinary preferences. The kitchen team, however, confirms that they prepare wild birds and reptiles daily. Bear meat and monkeys are more of a speciality. Tsai Win explains that bear meat is thought to yield many positive health benefits. Outside, bear cubs are available to be served as a healthy meal. Tiger wine is sold as an after-dinner drink. It is brewed in a neighboring shop where tiger bones float in a large tub of ginseng. It is said that a few years ago, the daughter of a high-ranking Chinese official was visiting from Beijing and lost over 100,000 US dollars in one evening in the casinos. Soon thereafter, the government in Beijing intervened and the casinos were closed. Subsequently, the economy of Mong Lao took a downturn. The official border crossing between Mong Lao and China, which once processed 6,000 visitors daily, is today very quiet. So too is the nightlife. The Eastern European dancers and the Thai transvestites have left. Most of the prostitutes remaining are Chinese. In the morning, part of the red light district becomes a market for another commodity, also considered taboo on the China side of the border. Items catering to the Chinese culinary preferences are openly on display. Dogs are sold in the domestic livestock section. The stroll through this market seems to illustrate what scientist Richard Leakey refers to as the sixth extinction. Here, photography is not always welcome. This is probably the worst example I've seen anywhere else in terms of live animals, in terms of meat. There isn't too much today, but I've seen a lot more. And then the Chinese medicine products. And clearly it's from the, you know, most of these products come from the immediate region here. Uh, clearly it's not sustainable. Clearly it's based on the new demand from the Chinese immigrants and tourists which come. 
and clearly it will not last. These Chinese medicine products will mostly cross the border. Whoever buys here will take them for resale on the other side. And as such, you know, it contravenes the CITES convention. So even international conventions seem to do little to stop or slow down this trade. The most expensive item found is the penis of a small tiger. How much does it cost a real one? Thousand five hundred dollars for this. Twelve thousand yeah. For this little beast. These are the, the bear gal brothers and about 13, 14, 15, 16. 19, 20 we counted two there. 21, 22, 23, 24. Is this a so people eat this? She doesn't want to talk to me, okay. I don't think it's her store. We don't tell her. Don't okay, you're not happy? Okay, I'm not happy either. Makes two of us. Government and army officials visit the market, but do not seem to have law enforcement in mind. A WA army officer examines part of a Eurasian pig, then has his assistant buy it. Man continues taking pictures of live animals in cages, fresh meat, and thousands of items for traditional Chinese medicine. Many of the animals, such as the pangolin, are endangered and protected under both Myanmar and Chinese laws, laws which don't seem to matter. They allow to, to cast the animals because it's better than building opium. Two tourists from China buy a primate skeleton. On the other side of the river from the official border gate is the unofficial border crossing. The tourists are returning to China with the primate skeleton, but not by way of the official border. So why don't they go through the official border? I think it's, uh, maybe it's just only the border people. The border people, they, they know each other and they give a... Yeah, but the last time, remember, they pushed the whole yeah, things around, lots, to the lake, yeah, to go the around the fence. And then the la there was only a hole people could go through, but now everybody goes through. Yeah. At the official border crossing, the welcome into China is quite formal and cautious. While only 50 meters away, it appears that anyone with something to hide can cross easily without getting sprayed. A few meters from the unofficial border is the bear breeding establishment. Here, eight Asian black bears are being raised for eventual sale for bear banquets across the border in Yunnan province. Most were captured as babies by hill tribesmen using packs of dogs. Like the majority of the population of Special Region 4, the owner of these bears, Lao Qin, is a Chinese national. An adult bear costs about 10,000 US dollars. When the time comes, it is electrocuted with two live wires. Mong Lao is home to some 80 bears of all ages, all in small cages. Asian black bears are listed in Appendix 1 of the CITES Convention, which prohibits the trafficking of endangered and protected species across international borders, and to which both Myanmar and China are signatories. Nowhere else has a man seen such blatant disregard for CITES. So it appears uh, this border has very little meaning. Here is the illegal side of the river, which is also the border. And over there we can see the official border. There's even a tower up there with a CCTV camera. So there's no doubt that the Chinese are fully aware of the existence of these bears. There's no doubt that they know they're going to be taken across for bear banquets. And as such, uh, site, this is pretty much a joke in this, in this region or along this border. The next step in this investigation is to determine where all this wildlife comes from. This road is being constructed through the hilly terrain along the Chinese border. 
The population consists largely of indigenous hill tribes, such as the Akas. Most still live traditional lives in small villages. <laughs> Wildlife trading seems to have become an important economic activity in this area. <laughs> These Akka women have found some young civet cats. The fact that civet cats have been identified as a source of the cross-species transmission of the SARS virus seems to be largely unknown or forgotten. <laughs> Much of the hunting is still done using old front-loading muskets. <laughs> In a nearby village, the plumage of a pheasant is being dried. In the mornings, groups of traders on motorbikes head for the hills. They buy any fresh meat or live animals offered for sale along the new roads to be taken back to market in Monglao before noon. Another new road leads to an area of coal mining where some more environmental degradation is apparent. Some of Myanmar's last valuable timber is cut deep within the Shan state, then transported mostly at night across the border into China. Some of the hunters confirm that the larger cats are becoming rare. In these hills, the last wild elephants have been gone since the 1960s, and as the forests have disappeared, so too have the monkeys. This hunter shot a leopard cat the evening before, and is now awaiting the Chinese trader who passed earlier in the morning to buy it. Is it always the same people who buy them? <laughs> Back in Monglao, a fresh leopard skin is staked out by the roadside to dry. The trader has just negotiated the cost of the meat over her mobile phone. For both the skin and the meat, she will get about 1,500 US dollars. Through the interpreter, she tells a man that leopards are rare nowadays. She gets many leopards. How often? The, the, the hill tribe people. Visiting the back of her house, it becomes clear that she is a serious trader with many reptiles and rolled and dried hides, including those of four golden cats. A man and Wynne continue down the road to visit a trader whom Aman met on a previous trip to Monglao. On the way, they encounter another trader and stop to take some pictures. Take some pictures, no? Here they find their first tiger skin for sale. Even posing as potential buyers, however, does not result in a welcome photography session. The owner's SUV bears license plates for Special Region 4. In the corridor stack some caged bears being fattened. Next door they find a small caged monkey. Monkey brains are considered a special delicacy, as Wynne explains. Like in the restaurant, they like to eat the brain and the, the monkey brain. <laughs> so before they have the table, the monkey table, oh, oh, if you like know, this know, monkey. Know. It seems an absurd environment in which Aman finds himself. Another seven adolescent bears. A man encounters an old acquaintance, a wildlife trader whom he met on a previous trip. A deal is just being concluded. On the floor lie four bear paws from an animal which was found in the nearby hills a few days ago. The four paws bring the dealer about 1,500 US dollars. Here on my very first trip, and there, this gentleman here in the white jacket had the uh, very big tiger skin and a crate of bones. And I asked him how much he had sold it for. So the, the skin sold for 50,000 and the, the, the crate of bones for 80,000. That's 130,000. So we're getting to 17, 18,000 dollars. 
just for the two components and there's the meat and other parts as well. So it shows what the values are of tigers, but it is the last tiger he has seen. As the local wildlife disappears, gambling is being reactivated. There's now about 20 new active casinos, less elaborate in terms of investment than uh, what we saw in Mong La, but functioning casinos nevertheless. What was very interesting though is all the dealers were constantly on their mobile phones. They were permanently plugged into uh, ground plugs. And when I asked, I was told uh, to look at the CCTV cameras overhead and basically they're transmitting via internet what goes on into China. Uh, the Chinese so-called bosses have their messengers or their boys who do the betting for them over the mobile phone. So it's all kind of remote now. Aman and Win visit the Monglao Paradise, an entertainment park in the hills outside of town. Located here is a bear bile farm. These bile products are clearly destined for export to China, again in contravention of the CITES Treaty. Chinese authorities contend that such products are consistent with long-established traditions and culture. Their effectiveness is undetermined, however, and could perhaps be achieved with synthetic compounds. These bears supply the bile. They're milked on a daily basis using permanently implanted catheters, a technique which is no longer allowed within China itself. This is this uh, bear bile farm in Mongla, and it's really about the worst animal welfare scenario I have ever encountered. I mean, this is not a question of survival of some hunters. This is a question of really commercial business, trying to make a fast buck, all wild caught bears. So no excuse as far as the Chinese are concerned of their bear farms keeping uh, wild bears safe in the forests. These are all caught by the tribal villagers, sold. They've lived here now four or five years. And, uh, you know, what's even worse this time is the fact that they now seem to rub their heads against the cages. A lot of them have their heads chaffed off from this rubbing. And they're now starting to milk them, which is a daily scenario, but they are more sensitive this time. There are some 60 bears in this facility. Some of the cages, which were occupied on Oman's visit a year earlier, now stand empty. What I find particularly distressing here is, of course, the fact that they seem to illustrate on this wall that they, per they know perfectly well how a bear should live and what makes a bear happy. And the contrast between bears playing around, roaming through forests, swimming in lakes, and then this scene is probably as drastic as it gets. But it illustrates, you know, that they know well what a normal bear life would be like. And that I have a hard time to accept. Recently, there have been indications that officials in Beijing may be rethinking China's bear farming policy. If this facility is any indication, however, even if Chinese bear farms are closed, owners could simply move their operations across borders into neighboring countries such as Myanmar. It would appear that CITES rules and regulations will not pose major obstacles to the exporting of bear products back into China. On two occasions, Amman attempted to interview officials with Special Region 4. However, because foreign journalists are not officially allowed in Myanmar to begin with, this had to wait until the end of his trip, with the evidence he'd gathered well out of sight. The director of tourism for Mong Lao did confirm that the illegal wildlife trade is an issue which has come up in the past. He agreed to present the subject again to Special Region 4 authorities, but stated that he was not hopeful that it would be taken seriously. We don't like all these dead animals in the market.
，但是政府没有引起足够的重视，我们会再和政府汇报的，就希望政府正视这一块，不要再滥滥杀这些野生动物。CITES is a United Nations convention which regulates the trading of listed animal species across all international borders. Uh, this semi-autonomous region of, uh, you know, semi-autonomous region for Mon La, that area. And, uh, I mean, I've never seen anything as blatant as what I have seen there. Both Myanmar and China are signatories to the CITES convention. At the CITES headquarters in Geneva, Switzerland, Aman presented his findings to the senior officer for CITES enforcement, John Sellers. And uh, then you have a, a rusty fence sticking in the river, which is the unofficial border. And you can watch people pushing their tricycle bicycles around this international border. So we went to the other side and we could actually film and photograph the cages of the bears, the people going illegally around the border and the imposing Chinese three-story border gate in the background. I mean, if I wanted to set up a film featuring corruption and wildlife crime, I, I couldn't, I wouldn't have dared stage such a setting. You know, if you provide me with evidence of that, I, I will write to both uh, China and Myanmar and ask them to take action. Right. Um, you know, certainly, I, I, uh, you know, our experience of China uh, is that when we provide them with, with information relating to illegal activities, they, they will respond and yeah. they will take action. Um, Myanmar also uh, is, is is relatively responsive, uh, and, and I think we work well with, with the, the government in Myanmar. Back in Geneva a year later, this time with a Swiss TV crew, Aman found that nothing had changed. During an upcoming standing committee meeting for CITES, the CITES secretariat was asked to arrange an interview with the head of the Chinese delegation. After three requests had been conveyed, they finally responded with a counter-request that all questions be provided in advance. Once this was done, however, they declined to be interviewed on camera. Limit the statements no more than five or six minutes. <laughs> About six months later, Aman returned to Monglao, but it was evident that nothing had changed there either. <laughs>